Hey guys, welcome to another movie commentary. I'm Avarice. Tonight we will be watching Halloween, the original John Carpenter film from 1978. You'll be able to faintly hear it in the background, and I will be commenting over it, making jokes, insight, whatever. So, basically I'll give you a second, get yourself oriented, and then I will be pushing play. Okay, get settled in here, get the volume right. Okay, so I'm getting ready here, and I'm hitting play in three, two, one, play. Ah, uh, it's loading here. There's the classic music. This is the original OG, the good shit. That font, that color, the score, the mask, Donald Pleasance. Oh! It's all, all, all the, the number one. This is the number one Halloween, and the first one ranks highest, all that. So right away we've got this shot of the pumpkin. I wish the pumpkin was a little bigger here, to be honest. Um, I guess they do zoom in on it, but if you look closely, the nose has that slit in it, and it is... Uh, the knife that Michael uses. What's odd about this pumpkin is it's very imperfect, but it's perfect for this. Um, you know, it's not symmetrical, it's got its flaws, but it's almost like a cartoon character. Very rarely are those drawn to be an accurate representation of what they are, but they work in their imperfection. John Carpenter and Deborah Hill, the OGs. This score is just unbelievable. <sighs> oh, so I'm a big fan of the series. My previous and first commentary I did was to the new Halloween 2018, which is meant to be a direct sequel to this and ignore all the sequels in between, which is interesting. And I'm also going to attempt to watch this as if I don't know that Lori is his sister, because that wasn't the intention in this first movie. This, that, that wasn't part of the story that was added later. Haddonville, Illinois. Halloween night, 1963. <clears throat> this is five years before my dad was born. <laughs> this is the classic tracking shot. I believe that there's no cuts in this, but I see a couple spots where you could put a cut in if you wanted and it wouldn't be that hard. The one individual jack-o'-lantern on the porch. I like that. It could be in this shot right here by the door. That might have been better, but... <clears throat> A lot of the other movies just overdo it with the jack-o'-lanterns. They'll have like fucking 20 jack-o'-lanterns around one house. Nobody does that. That dude does not look comfortable the way he's sitting. Were people this laissez-faire in the 60s? My six-year-old brother's around someplace. Let's not bother locating him. Let's go have sex first. Actually, she never even tries to locate him. He locates her, as we all know. She gets a couple of stickins tonight. So they're up there already, and they turn the light off. It's a long tracking shot walk around the back. A movie these days would never do lighting this way. I just saw the shadow of somebody on the house. You're not meant to see. Apparently this house was really dilapidated and they only repaired the parts that were necessary for this shot. That's a big knife for a little kid. 
but this the height I saw the shadow of the camera there too on the wall the height that that knife was at was not even close to accurate for a kid but we got to give this movie a lot of passes because of the budget the time they had and it's the original it created it it wasn't meant to be some big production or anything it was meant to just get it out collect a few bucks and move on so I was trying to count I think that they've been up there for about 45 seconds and he's already dressed Maybe that's why she's naked when Michael goes up there. She's still got to take care of herself. She's going to brush her hair and light some candles and release the doves. Everything's painted white. That's, I guess, I'm assuming they just bought a five-gallon bucket of white paint and painted everything they needed to have repaired for this shot. <clears throat> a lot of the shadows and shit I'm seeing I've never seen before. Uh, I just got a new huge TV that's Ultra HD and this is the a high quality version of the movie so a lot of this stuff especially back then like when it came out in theaters or on VHS whatnot you couldn't see this shit so those flaws kind of have to be accepted there's those titties god damn they didn't have fake tits in 1978 did they wearing those granny panties though why did it take so long for people to think of thongs Ugh, that meat sound she's <laughs> oh man that's so apparently they put the mask in in post-production which is interesting because that means that it was shot where you could see the knife and her and everything in the center of the frame and then the mask was imposed over that as opposed to knowing what you were going to be able to see through the mask this is interesting here because he's just got this blank stare it's almost like the the human part of him's gone he's just it's is just emotionless now and he does kind of have black looking eyes there and note that he has blonde hair I'll address that again later the reaction of the parents though I don't know if this is supposed to be a standstill shot like are they supposed to be frozen or is this supposed to be time lapsing because that would not be your reaction if your six-year-old had a bloody knife and you just came home okay Smith's Grove Illinois October 30th, 1978. So just shy of 15 years later. <clears throat> it's pouring rain. I live in Portland. We have these days often. This shitty old shit brown, baby shit brown station wagon. There's Dr. Loomis in his yellow tinted shirt. And the smoking nurse. I forget her name. Right away, he's super intense and seems concerned. Like, he doesn't want to bullshit. He doesn't care about small talk. He wants to, he wants this to be over with. He is actually concerned about this process and what's about to happen and getting Michael somewhere else and how it's going to be handled. So there, he's, he's kind of right, and that's the one thing that she doesn't have to worry about because Michael doesn't talk, is the babbling. But don't underestimate him. It, actually, yeah, he refers to it as it. Refers to Michael as it. She just put a cigarette out, and then she's lighting another cigarette. And then she puts down... No. Thorazine. So Loomis looks down and sees the rabbit in red matchbook. She smokes parliaments. Those are gross in my opinion. Serious about it. See, there's a lot of it. She said, can we refer to it as him? And he kind of brushed that off. And they don't... Uh,
Yeah, see, Loomis is not thrilled about this idea at all. He's like, we just got to get this over with, get this motherfucker locked down. <clears throat> but it is our duty to get him there and bring him before the court. <laughs> Since when do they let him walk around? Well, um, yeah, they don't usually let people at a mental institution just wander around ever. What kind of a dumbass are you? Loomis did some great acting there with his eyes. He's contemplating the situation and what's going on. Now, you move like a cat, Ernie. So Michael obviously knew that they were coming. If you watch here closely, when he breaks the window, he's got a wrench in his hand. Oh, at first he's gonna reach in and grab her and rip off her hat, her little paper hat. <clears throat> Who stomps on the pedals when they can't even see where they're going? Now, that would give me a heart attack. And then roll the window up instead of backing to the other side. But here, there's a wrench in his hand and they painted it. See? Boom. You can see the wrench right there. Yeah, they painted it skin colored and glued it to his hand so he could break the window. The fluidity with which he gets in that car and takes off is amazing for a person who has never driven a car before. It's uncanny. Like, it's... I know it's one of the great mysteries of Michael that makes him so intriguing, but that really, I want that explained. I'd like to know how. How? Of course, I don't want a backstory like Rob Zombie gives him, though. And seeing that much of Michael in the hospital didn't really add to the story we found out. Because that was the one area when Rob Zombie remade it that he had freedom. He had this kind of, he had to follow the basic story of this movie but he had that huge gap of when Michael goes from a kid to an adult and that's where he chose to get creative and expand and it didn't work out so well for him so here this is shot in California and they had to attempt to make it look like fall so they took all these leaves and they painted them and scattered them on the ground and they'd have to pick them up at the end of each scene and use them again later <clears throat> But you'll notice all the trees and everything are green. So it doesn't really look like fall, but it feels like fall somehow. I'm not sure how they accomplished it because it's definitely not a fall environment. At some point, we'll even see palm trees. We might have already seen them, but I missed it. So now we're introduced to Lori. She is walking to school. See, all the leaves are on the trees. I mean, if you, that's, it looks like summertime where I live. But the, they did manage to capture this small town feel, even though they're in Pasadena. Why is she just carrying her books? They didn't have backpacks in 1978. Same with this kid. He's just carrying his shit. What are you doing? Oh man, little kids are... Can we do this? Yes, yes, yes. They're like a robot. They just keep coming at you, keep coming at you. So, what's interesting that I've kind of noticed about this is the that Tommy kind of looks like Michael did when he was little. He's a little blonde-haired kid. He's probably older than Michael was when he killed his sister. But... As they approach the house here, Michael's already there. And he seems to become obsessed with these two, Lori specifically, right off the get. So it's almost as if he looks at them as a representation of him and his sister. That's what I pick up on. So she's supposed to be watching him tonight, taking him trick-or-treating, all this stuff. It's reminding him of the night he killed his sister. And, and he's projecting all the emotions he had about his sister onto Lori. So now he's gonna come out. He already has the mask because you can hear him breathing and you could see his hair was kind of fucked up in that uh, silhouette shot. 
and he also has the jumpsuit which he got en route to Haddonfield so and the song she's singing her and John Carpenter actually wrote and recorded I believe because they couldn't afford the trademarks to any real songs This character is interesting. They could have expanded more on this character. I guess they did later in the sequels, but that wasn't... Obviously, John Carpenter didn't have it in mind originally. Donald Pleasance is amazing. He's telling... He's really uh, exuding how pissed off he is and how much of an emergency this situation... <laughs> he was doing very well last night. How much of an emergency this situation is. Like, he seems to be the only one to understand, like, this is a fucking monster that just got out of here. It's interesting why he's the only one that was able to see it. Now, we've got this classic scene of the teacher talking about fate and how fate's concrete, it's unavoidable, it's uh, an element, almost, <clears throat> of nature. Almost like uh, the way... Earth, water, fire, wind, F your fate is just a part of nature and you can't do anything about it. She is going to look out the window now and he's staring out there at her. <coughs> Excuse me. So he got in his car and drove to the school so that he could spy on her immediately after. He saw her at the house. He's just locked onto her. Her ability to listen and not pay attention or not be focused on the teacher is great. I used to get in trouble for this at school. I would, uh, I'd be talking to somebody else and the teacher would say, what did I just say? And I'd think about it for a second and I'd be able to recall it. And so many teachers would get pissed off when I would do that because they, their argument was gone because I remembered what they said instead of just telling me to pay attention right off the get. So Michael goes from her school and now he shows up at Tommy's school here. First time we get introduced to Lonnie. Get your ass away from there. That is a big ass pumpkin. If my, like, that's ambitious. What, he go to the pumpkin patch today at school? Like, you're gonna decide to carry that home? That it is, I would never <laughs> have done that. Lonnie's the one in the middle, right, in the red? We get candy. These kids are ruthless. What makes each one of these kids think that the other ones that are making fun of him are cool? Like, and so they all join in. That, that sound as he runs into that kid is just on point. <clears throat> but he lets him go. No interest in harming the kid. He kind of scares him there, but you don't even know if it was intentional. Now he just slowly walks around the fence, picks up his pace a little bit there because he realizes he's got to get to his car so he can follow Tommy the man, Tommy the boy, Tommy boy, fat guy in a little coat. And now he gets kind of creeper on him. This is like PSA stuff. He's uh. Driving around in the for official state use only vehicle that has a caged off backseat wearing a white Halloween mask. Nobody finds this suspicious. It was the 70s. Now, Tommy coming. He has no school books or anything, which is impressive. Wonder if teachers didn't give any homework. His feet are landing real flat when he walks there. It's good. And then Michael speeds off. Like, I don't, I don't know exactly why he went to the school to spy on Tommy like that. Is he making sure that, like, Tommy's a good kid and he thinks that he's defending Tommy from Lori because he's projecting his sister onto Lori? Here we've got more Loomis calling ahead, telling the sheriff and everybody or whoever that uh, 
basically what he does in all the movies, but this is the first one, so you have to take it, or you're more, what's the phrase I'm looking for? You're not shocked by it, but it has more intensity to it the first time you watch the first movie because he is so concerned about this. He knows that there is a fucking hurricane of kitchen knives that's about to come through that town and nobody wants to listen to him. And there's the matchbook. So he, he knows Michael's been through here. He found the hospital robes and the matchbook. And there's the mechanic. We don't really know. There's some blood there. Maybe he broke his neck. Wonder if he stole his underwear. That voice that's doing the cheerleading almost sounds like Annie's. PJ Souls kind of comes off as like a California Valley girl. And they're supposed to be in the Midwest. And in the Midwest, in, in late October, it's fucking cold. I, they're dressed like they're in California in the fall. This is wintertime in California, let's be honest. Maybe that was Annie because she wasn't in the scene and now she's in this. I kind of feel like the uh, PJ Soul's character doesn't belong in this group of friends. Maybe Lori doesn't belong in this group of friends, but it doesn't seem like this trio would be the tight click. Maybe I'm wrong. Old Jerko. Is that how people talk then? Again with the no backpacks, but just carrying books. Oh, I'm proud of being a shitty at something. It's like people that glorify their uh, shitty eating or their fact that they drink all the time and they shit blood. Hey, I forget my books all the time. That makes me awesome. <laughs> no. Oh, you could, I could actually see his mask there. What? She pissed Michael off. <laughs> my grandmother was addicted to speed. She killed my grandfather. Where do you think I'm getting it from? Rob Zombie will tell you. Never quite understood why he did that because he usually is not so overt. At least not until he's going for the kill. Normally if he's stalking or that kind of thing, he kind of just passes by. He's not going to... What? He's not going to react that way. She she got his goat for some reason. I wonder if he decided then that he was going to kill her first. Because he was interested in Lori. And he came up and then she yelled. And I wonder if he's like, you know what, bitch? You're going to get it first. Yeah, there was no internet or anything. It was rough times. Read a book or knit, I guess. Cleans them. Builds them. Again, with the music, they just... It's not over the top, it's simple. And it gets to that part, like, that part in your chest that, oh shit, like when your heart jumps, it just gets in there. When I was a little kid, if I heard the bump, 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 I, I would actually get scared just hearing the song. Michael Myers for me is the number one slasher. This is the, the number one OG started it all slasher movie. And uh, my evidence for that is the fact that I used to have horrible nightmares about these movies and only about these movies. There's Michael super stalkerish just standing. Like he has a lot of strategy and tact about him, but at other times he's just like, here I am. No, I'm not. So we actually see him step back there. He doesn't just disappear. Let's see, it's probably been about like 10 seconds between when he stepped back and when he had time to walk to the other side of the bush. I think, let's see how far it is. 
Well, it's not going to show how far it is for a minute, but yeah. There just went John Carpenter's smoke across the screen. And after this scene gets over, when they're walking away from the bushes, if you look over the hedge, you'll see a production assistant standing up on a ladder or something watching them. Which I guess adds to the creepy factor, because if you don't know that that's who he is, <clears throat> pardon, you could just think he's a neighbor or something watching him. But you're going to see him. There he is right there. It's on the stairs, actually. There's another person, actually, too. There's two people standing there watching him. It's like the, the neighbors know they're going to get it. Or they're like, who's this fucking guy staring at these girls? Should we call the cops? She's got a painted leaf in her hair. Boo. <laughs> Oh, everyone's entitled to one good scare. You know, it's Halloween. I guess everyone's entitled to one good scare, huh? Nice to meet you. Jamie Lee Curtis was very, very pretty. When she's actually, I mean, she's maintained very well her entire life. She's still, for her age, doing pretty well, let's be honest. Did you spray down the street and the sidewalk with a hose to make it... No, it just freshly rained. That helps with the fall look. Is that meant to be a sound that you're concerned... Supposed to be concerned about? It sounded like laughter to me. Yeah, it's laughter. Who the hell trick-or-treats that early in the afternoon? She's just walking home from high school. It's like 3 o'clock. How are those kids home, changed into their car? What is going on right now? Man, this super big TV and HD version, I could see Jamie Lee's nipples through that sweater. Just barely. We're not talking Jennifer Aniston and Friends, but I could see him. She's not wearing a bra. Ooh, Michael. See, how did he know how to walk back and get... And did he just straight up disappear there like he does in 4? Like, is there... Is she looking right at him and then he's gone? Because there's that cut to her face and then back to him. Does she see him move? Or is he just... He's the Flash. Okay. I've never done who calls somebody and then is just chewing and doesn't acknowledge them when they ask you questions that's the rudest these people aren't her friends they just take advantage of her she's the one who doesn't belong in the group I was wrong PJ Souls and the Annie should be friends and Jamie Lee Curtis Lori Strode should find a new group of friends she needs to spin that globe wherever her finger lands she needs to go there and look for a bride no way, that's coming to America. You've grown a mustache. Yes, yes, in the face! It's halftime, man. Man, that's a tiny ass bed. Tell your parents to get you a bigger ass bed. How do you sleep on that? I have a king size bed, and it's not big enough. Granted, I have a wife and a pit bull to sleep with me, though. So any of you bitches thinking about breaking into my house, check yourself. Pit bull, bite your dick off. Now, she's got to carry a big-ass pumpkin over there, because Tommy dropped his big-ass pumpkin. I don't think they communicated that, communicated that to each other, but uh, her babysitter telekinesis told her she had to bring a pumpkin because Tommy was going to be without, despite the fact that he wanted to carve the pumpkin so badly. This is some weird, like, I'll walk down to the corner and meet you shit, like, Annie couldn't just drive 20 yards to her house and pick her up right there, so she didn't have to wait outside for her. Man, those 70s collars. Why don't you just wrap it around your back? Go under your armpit and around your back with that collar. I guess that one's not as bad as some of them. Here comes Annie, slow rolling. Speed kills! Is 
So the Michael kill count so far is at two. He killed his sister when he was six, and now he's broken out, and he killed that mechanic and stole his uh, jumpsuit. And then, obviously, he's already broken into the hardware store very early in the day, or last night, because he had the mask at the very beginning of the day when Lori walked by in the morning. He had the mask already, so he, he broke in there almost immediately and got the mask, the ropes, and the knife. It's almost like he's had a plan in mind for how, how and what he wants to do. <laughs> this old guy. Loomis just doesn't give a shit about what he's saying at all. And actually, they, this story added, when, at least when I was a kid, listening to this guy talk, added to the scariness of the movie. He never even finishes the story. Wait, well, shut up. God damn it, where are we? <laughs> Look at how dirty this motherfucker is. I guess he works at a graveyard. But this place isn't even well met. What is this? There's the, It's a field of weeds with gravestones. Why would a kid steal a gravestone? Like, how often does that happen? Does it happen often enough that there's a name for it? Like, going Dutch? Why would he want that? I know that he has this weird fascination with his sister. Even though in this movie, Jamie Lee's not supposed to be his sister, it seems as though he is looking at these girls as representations of his sister. They're around that age. They're kind of, well, I don't know, but that seems to be the thing. And then he goes back and steals his sister who's already been dead that he killed before. He steals her gravestone. Why would he want that? Is he trying to, I don't know. So you want her memory gone? Like the, if the tombstone is gone, then it's like she's totally gone. There's no record of her. And how fucking heavy would that thing be? That whole, that tombstone would weigh several hundred pounds. She never glances up at the rear view mirror at all and notices that he's right on her ass. He seems to know that he should pull off from the hardware store because she's going to run into the cops and he robbed it. <laughs> Being natural. She rolls the window down and immediately starts talking to him. The smell would have had no chance to get out of there. He would have smelled that. Trust me, he would have smelled that. Unless it was the worst weed ever. He... <clears throat> so the original Michael Myers mask came from a corner hardware store. And he stole the knives and the rope. What did he use the rope for? Was it to pull the tombstone out? Was he wearing the mask while he was pulling the tombstone out? Uh, somebody needs to make a fan film of that. I had an idea, I mean, I don't know if I'll ever pursue it, but you could, it would be called, a, a series called Filling in the Gaps, and it would be fan films of all the parts in Halloween where we don't know where Michael is and what he's up to. Of course, the big ones would be like in the hospital, things like that, but, you know, just when he leaves the, the mental institution and then he shows up later in Haddonfield, just a fan film of what he's doing the whole drive and that kind of thing. Or uh, in H2O when his his tire blows out and he's got to pull into the rest stop with the blown out tire. That kind of shit I think would be funny. So despite nearly getting caught, they lit the joint back up and they're getting blazed before they uh, go babysitting. This is a very high school girl conversation. I mean, it's a uh, high school boys kind of talk like this too, but it's more, it's not quite so uh, vulnerable and honest. <laughs> I 
See, the, she just confided in her and was vulnerable there, and she's laughing at her and throwing it back in her face, and she's going to essentially ask this guy out on Lori's behalf against her will. These are not good friends. Man, it's weird watching it <laughs> in this high quality on a big TV because you could just see Michael's mask the whole time. <laughs> He's driving, and it looks funny to see somebody driving around in the mask. Okay. It went from the sun slowly, slightly setting to pitch black dark. This town is not supposed to be that big. Were they driving around in circles for an hour? So she drops Lori off. Does he leave the car there? Annie's right across the street, isn't she? He does not leave the car there, but he's scoped out, so he knows exactly where both of them are going to be now. And he probably overheard them talking about babysitting while they were walking. Man, he's ballsy. He just parked right in front of their houses. And now he's going to do the creeper behind the tree move with the white mask. I feel like I would notice that, but maybe not. Again, the house with the one individual jack-o'-lantern. I like it. It's not overdone. Granted, it's probably all they can afford. It's probably the same jack-o'-lantern. They move it from house to house for each shot. Now he's... <laughs> now he looks like a boyfriend that just got dumped, and he's stalking. I wanted to start singing a song, but it wasn't... It wasn't I wanted to say, if you knew my name... Would you know my name if I saw you in heaven? But that is about a totally different subject. Okay, now we're pulling back up to the old Myers house. This is shot really well. One of the things that John Carpenter did was most of the budget for this film was spent on Donald Pleasance, the proper um, camera and film, and post-production. And that's one of the reasons that it came out so well. Uh, he didn't he spent his money where it really counted and so it comes out looking like a much higher dollar production than it really was see now you can see that this house is dilapidated so they probably shot this before they shot that the opening murder because they haven't cleaned the house up yet so this is probably what it looked like before they came in and painted and everything for that opening tracking shot what you just assume that he's eating the dog? No, he's not so far based off, except for the fact that he drives cars. Only men drive cars, as far as I know. And computers, but they didn't have those then. Man, this place is tore up. You can see how much work they had to do to make it look like somebody was living in it before. It's always kind of a mind fuck when you realize that they had, they shot stuff out of sequence. Because, like, as a kid, I always just assume they shoot a movie in the order that it happens in. But they don't do that at all. Bedroom looks small. Why would he have needed to see her? He actually, he saw the lights turn off. He didn't see her. He lived there. Why would he need to see her from the lawn? <laughs> Man, he just whips that gun out and the sheriff's like, okay, this guy is cr crazier than I thought he was. First I was just playing along and now I might have a situation on my hand. He's almost looking at Loomis like Loomis is the problem he's gonna have to handle. This is the classic speech that probably most defines Michael over the entire timeline. Everybody who attempts to make a sequel has to come back to this being the definition of Michael. And it was a great, I mean, if you had to have one scene to define a character, this was it. 
Were they kind of fucked up? I, I mean, they, not here, but they didn't keep his, they don't have his speech recorded without the music. It's all mixed and overlaid together. So that's why in H2O, they had to bring a voice actor in to recreate it because they didn't have it all in one continuous thing without the backup score mixed in. <clears throat> Why would he not want them to to look for him? At this point, they don't know he's wearing a mask. I guess he would be hard to identify. But wouldn't you rather want the cops to know that there's somebody out there? Like, you're positive he's back. The cop isn't. I don't think the sheriff's positive, but Loomis is positive. I think Tommy's mom made his Halloween costume. That haircut. I wonder if it does it keep your ears warm if you have that haircut? I might need that. I wouldn't want the hair, I just want my ears to be warm. That couch though, and those curtains, the colors. Browns and oranges, what were you thinking? I wasn't alive then, so I, I can't say what were we thinking. What were they thinking? I just say we to try to make it seem like I'm not singling them out, but I guess I need to because I wasn't a part of it. German Shepherd Patrol. See, she thinks that the dog's freaking out at her, but it's probably freaking out because Michael's outside, and it can tell. He's slowly been circling and getting closer, and getting a little bit closer and a little bit closer. That's another thing that got lost in the Rob Zombie version, was because they added so much backstory once he started killing or once he got out as an adult it moved very quickly through the kills into the end because they didn't have a lot of time left and it's still like a two hour movie so they used up a lot of their screen time with his backstory and his childhood and getting out of the hospital and then these type of scenes where he's slowly stalking and moving in and it's scary for the audience because you don't know when he's going to jump and you're just worried about these people that have no idea that was lost a bit in the Rob Zombie version because he had to rush through the kills because it would have been a four hour movie. That's actually Deborah Hill wearing the mask in that scene because it's so far away you can't tell how short she is. Those fucking kids tormenting him about the boogeyman. Of course, Michael's gone. Was he staring across the street at them, or was he staring into the house that Annie's in? I've never thought about that before. I thought he was staring across the street, but he was probably staring at Annie. You can hear him breathing, so you know he's watching her. And he accidentally bumps the flower pot here, which is a r weird, rare moment for him. He's He hasn't had a chance to really perfect his craft. He just got out. He's incredibly proficient considering that he's, I mean, by all accounts, he hasn't worked out. He hasn't done anything. He hasn't been reading strategy books. <laughs> that brick backsplash, my God. Oh. He got a little too excited there, it seems. He saw her in that shirt with no pants on, and he... It was like it was drawing him in. Now we're back to this shot. He moved back around to the other side of the house. I wonder if this was the original way, and they decided to add that other scene in later. That dog would have got some damage in. You can't just reach down and and choke a dog like this. I know it makes him seem scary and intimidating, etc. And you're like, oh, fuck. But good luck doing that to a German Shepherd. Without at least getting your arms fucked up. Probably going to be missing a few fingers. So that's 
some serious territory. But again, it's a movie. He's a fictional character. I... When you start getting into super, super natural stuff, like how Jason gets, etc., you kind of lose me there. Part of the reason I like Michael is because it almost seems explainable. It's almost like it's in grasp. You're not exactly sure if he's part human and what's going on. He seems like... Because he's the shape. He's the shape of a man. And they don't go too far with the supernatural stuff. It's more easy for me to buy into. When he's when you just have you know Jason that can't be killed and can't be drowned and can be struck by lightning and has meat falling off his bones but yet he's superhuman strong and it, it just it loses it for me. I had a crazy dream once. I assume it was a dream, but I woke up in my bed and I rolled over. And I swear to God, it looked like the band Guns N' Roses were all sitting around on the, not on the floor, they were like on bar stools or, or like stumps essentially, like smoking and talking in my bedroom, which probably sounds cool as an adult, but I was like five years old. So I thought I rolled over and saw all these long haired dudes carrying on in my bedroom. And I was so scared that I just rolled back over and tried to go to sleep. I think it was ultimately a dream because I doubt that really happened and I woke up and there was nobody in my room. The stumps come into play because we had a wood-burning stove in my in my room. So uh that's why there would be stumps there. Now does the door do that on its own or does he do that? I think it did it on its own. Oh, no, there he is. That's a creepy fucking shot. They just, they nailed the mask so much. It's inherently terrifying for some reason. I have one. I don't have this one, unfortunately. I have the shitty one that's uh, like Halloween 4. But I've put it on around people before, and they actually sincerely ask me to take it off because it's terrifying. Just, just the way it looks when you're moving around and when your eyes look, and if you don't talk, that's the key thing. You can't talk. If you talk with that mask on, you look fucking ridiculous. You also have to carry it right. You can't be walking like a fucking dunce. Kid locked into the TV. Once TV came out, this was what most kids became. He's doing the head tilt as he stares at her through the back window. I've never noticed that he could that you could see him back there before. And he moves like a fucking cat because as soon as she turns around, he's gone. I never quite understood how she gets stuck in this window. Because she, does she, she gets her hips and butt out. Right? <laughs> Don't ask so troubled. She hung up the phone. The kid's not scared of the dark or anything at all. I'd have been creeping around out there. She was just watching a scary movie. Oh, her foot is stuck on the shelf. Man, it's not a bad position to have your girl stuck in. Call Paul and just tell him to come over. Leave her in the window. I'm just playing. But for real, for like a, a foreplay, or not a for a role-playing situation, that wouldn't be a bad one. Oh, I'm stuck in the window. Help me. Here I am to save the day, but first I must collect my fee. Run back to the phone. They didn't have caller ID. They didn't have voicemail. Definitely didn't have cell phones. Oh, 
Whose shirt did she put on? She got hers all fucked up. She just go put on like the dad's shirt that lives there. Oh, he's getting he he wants her so bad. He's so good at just disappearing out of the way when. So Michael can hear her. Super vintage Quaker Oats oatmeal canister on the shelf. The thing. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm doing. And like when my furnace turns on or my refrigerator makes a noise, I have, I want to go over and check it out, but I can't because I'm watching this and doing the commentary. So I just have to hope that I don't get murdered. It's too bad I'm not live streaming this so that if I did get murdered, at least people would know about it. The three or four people that watch my videos. So Michael's managed to make himself unseen to this point, except for by Tommy across the street. He stayed out of the way. Oh, he was standing, but hiding behind the car. The way he popped up there was like a pop-up book or a Jack in the Box. Just, it's weird that he was squatting down behind the car like that. I know it makes the shot cool, but it's kind of not something that Michael would do. He would have just been a little bit farther back behind the tree or something. So he heard her on the phone and then decided to go across the street and wait for her. Lori is like all American good girl. Other than the weed smoking, but I smoke weed, so I don't give a fuck about that. She's good at school. She's a good babysitter. She cares about what the kid reads. She's doing the jack-o'-lantern with him. She's all mom outfitted up right now. She takes on this responsibility. But here's another example of her friends using her. Here, babysit the kid that I'm probably getting paid to babysit so I can go fuck my boyfriend. And maybe I'll think about undoing the mess that I got you into because I'm a bitch. Is that a menorah in the farm? Uh, on the mantle? Looks like a menorah. No, not quite. Look at those flower pots all over the ground. Is that what you call a Haddonfield garden? So the door is locked here. So Michael must be in the vicinity and he knows that she's going to take the car. <clears throat> she goes back whistling this fucking annoying song. I hope that my wife doesn't whistle so and sing songs about me. <laughs> she's cleaning the house or something or getting ready to go out to dinner. I've never thought about that before. She's just walking around whistling and singing my name and making up shitty song lyrics. How embarrassing. <laughs> oh, oh, it's funny though. It'd be hilarious to walk in on her doing it. With <laughs> like if Paul walked in right now, would she be bashful or which? She... Okay, here's an important thing. Annie doesn't notice that the door is unlocked. The whole, she went to open the door, realized she didn't have the keys, walked all the way in, and it comes back, and it's unlocked already. And the windows are fogged up. She's not the brightest. Now, he really gets into this. He has been waiting to kill this bitch for a minute. He's watched her strip down to her underwear, get bent over and stuck in a window. And, uh catch wrestling or mixed martial arts that's called a rape joke it's not a very secure way to hold somebody if she really started thrashing her body and stuff around she would twist out of this he doesn't have his other hand involved now did he just stab her or cut her throat where was the stab very little gore it's a lot of suspense in theater of the mind 
two kids glued into the scary movie. I'm assuming that they thought this shit was scary then. If you watch this now, it's it's PBS material. <laughs> look at that. Oh, look at how realistic. What's fucked up about this is that Tommy, who's been freaked out by the kids at school, actually thinks he's seen the boogeyman, is now going to turn around and freak out this girl, knowing damn well what it feels like to be scared like that. It's kind of a fucked up thing to do. And now, simultaneously, they can... That takes some strength to just walk like that with a, the dead weight of a fully grown woman in your arms. He's doing this like, he just kicks the fucking door open. Was it unlatched? Man, those blinds are going to be jacked. Calm down, calm down, hold your horses. I had several moments when I was a kid where I was afraid of someone and or afraid of something and nobody believed me. They always turned out to be right though. So while I feel for Tommy, I think the kids do this all the time and most of the time you just have to tell them that it's nothing. <laughs> she didn't know. She has to wait for Dr. Loomis to complain or uh, confirm it for her. As a matter of fact, it was. It would not be hard to see him standing there if you think about the shot that they just did. He's just on the other side of this bush here. <laughs> He's right by the tree. Like, it's... It wouldn't be difficult to see him. He's wearing a beige jacket. Who knows what these kids would have ended up doing if Dr. Loomis didn't scare him away. They could have ended up inside the house and filleted. Shish kebobbed. <laughs> His inflection there is so weird. Get your ass away from there. Jump scare number two, three. gave him a heart attack it's interesting that uh, Michael kind of goes out of his way to avoid Loomis he doesn't directly target him he kind of plays these cat and mouse games with him but he doesn't just try to outright eliminate him he's it's almost like there's a fear there like he knows that Loomis is the one who understands him So we, Michael, assuming that Michael is of above average intelligence, we know he's above average strength, but if he's truly been just sitting in a room staring at a wall, he could have come up with the most, and that his memory can support it. He could have come up with the most ridiculous plan. He could have thought this so far through every scenario. Like he could have really put some thought into this if that's truly what he was sitting there doing the whole time. It would be difficult to keep track of it all without ever having it written down or anything, but he also would have no other information going into his brain except for what he intended to do when he got out this night. And I guess he was just was waiting for the opportunity when they had to take him somewhere or transfer him or something to that effect. This conversation here is fucking weird. This dude makes like a child sexual assault joke and it just goes over. So he's going to rip her clothes off, then she's going to rip his clothes off, and then they're going to rip the little kid's clothes off. What the fuck does that even mean? How is that written, read by several people and fine, said by this dude, heard by everybody in the vicinity, and then ex and then left in through post-production? Is that just how shit went down in the 70s? That is a fucking appalling. I don't even know how you would ever think to say that. And... 
They're going over. So this is Lindsay's parents' house. Annie was supposed to be babysitting there, and these guys are going up there, over there, to fuck in Lindsay's parents' bedroom. How fucking re oh my god! If I was the da Lindsay's dad and I came home and I found this going on, oh, especially in the seventies. I hope this guy's eighteen because we'd be going mano a mano in the living room. After I put Lindsay to bed, because she doesn't need to see that. <laughs> so Michael's there. Did he know they were coming over? I forget. I believe it's we're going to pan back and he's watching. That hit just a little bit too early. It should have hit right when his shoulder came into the shot. The music, I mean. It's kind of a half-ass jack-o'-lantern, but it took a lot of work to clean that bitch out. You know it did. It's a big pumpkin. And cutting it, it would have thick walls. Ugh. So she sees her friend's van across the street. I had this coffee here this whole time and I haven't been drinking any of it. So now uh, Linda's gonna call over and find out that Annie or that Lindsay's over there. She's totally not here. I know that she's supposed to be like the, the cool hot chick for the time and in the movie, but the way she talks is so fucking annoying. I wouldn't be able to put up with that for more than 30 seconds. Actually, she'd be the kind of girl that you really put up with it at first because you want to fuck her, and then you either do fuck her and get sick of it, or you get sick of it long before you fuck her. But you get sick of it either way. Sometimes dudes don't even realize that they're putting up with shit that they normally wouldn't. Just because it's uh, it's a biological thing to want to pursue. Girls like that, especially at that age, it's so hard to control yourself. And obviously they aren't. Okay, who puts a, a jack-o'-lantern in their bedroom? I have never seen that in my entire life. That would be weird. I wonder who this is calling. Because they don't answer and then they take it off the hook. Is it, uh, is it Lori? And they go back after it. Break me up, give me some. No one mini man. Oh, the shadow. <laughs> what if she saw that on the wall? If any ladies are listening, which I supremely doubt, but who knows, I might appeal to a few. Um, <laughs> imagine being on top riding a dick. Oh, she was she on the bottom? I met my patio door smoking, and it's a bad angle. She was on the bottom. Never mind. I was gonna say, imagine being on top of your dude riding and you just see a shadow go across the headboard of somebody walking behind you. <laughs> oh man, my dick hurts thinking about how fast my wife would jump off. What's that movie where the, the new guy, where he breaks his dick? You can actually do that, by the way. It's not a bone, but you can tear the muscle tissue and kink it. It heals back kinked. I think you can actually cause like per permanent erectile dysfunction by doing it wrong too. Like those girls who like to get on top and ride rough and let it come in and out and shit. That you're, that you're, 
that's risky business. You could hit her pelvic bone or something and break your dick. So be careful with the crazy ones. I know they're fun. I know they're fun. But you you gotta resist. So this motherfucker, he just had sex in these people's bedroom and now he's going through their fridge. He's not even the one babysitting their kid. If anybody in the Halloween movies ever deserved to die, it was this guy. What a douchebag. This is the classic, probably my favorite of any kill ever. <laughs> Calls his girlfriend an asshole. Now you're gonna get it, motherfucker. It's his brother, Kane! It must be Kane! That must be Kane! Pete Rose is about to get fucked up. One thing I didn't like is that range of motion right there. You wouldn't be able to stab very deep into anything with that little weak range of motion. You'd need to swing that motherfucker back a little bit farther, especially to stick him into the door. But the feet dropping, they kind of call back to that in two when she or the shoes fall off the waitress. And that head cock. My dog does that when she's curious about something. Something catches her attention. She tilts her head like that. I wonder why he did that head tilt. Was he admiring his work? And then this is a strange move. Instead of stalking her, his traditional style, he chooses to dress up in a costume. Is he recreating his sister's murder? I don't know why he put the glasses on. <laughs> because when he killed his sister, when he was six, he had a mask on. As you remember, the shot through the eye holes. Which would be similar to his perception now. But he's wearing a mask anyway. What the fuck am I talking about? I do not know why he's wearing the ghost mask. I think he wanted to just see some titties. He's, he wanted her to guard to be down when he first came in. Michael's ability to put up with people talking non nonsense to him and not come back with a smart ass remark is uncanny. She does have decent little titties, let's be honest. See, he waited for her to get up and make the call. Now he's going to go into pursuit. I don't know. I don't know what he was thinking here. And this is actually going to end up being his final kill of the movie. He only has... He has the sister when he was six, the mechanic that he gets the jumpsuit from, Annie the boyfriend and Linda now those are the five kills in the entire movie it's actually kind of amazing extreme lack of gore not that many kills but it pulls off being terrifying somehow that's why Michael killed her it was a joke <laughs> that's just eerie for some reason and hilarious when he puts the phone up to his head Somebody should take that and remix it to like, I got two phones or something. I got two phones. Now she's starting to get worried. She's starting to believe in the boogeyman a little bit. And all the lights are off. Part of what makes this creepy is she can see the house. It's directly across the street. If they were across town from one another, it wouldn't play the same way. She wouldn't be able to walk over and investigate, that kind of thing. First of all, if I put you in charge of my kids, you don't leave the fucking house. How about that? You can call the cops and have them investigate, but you're staying parked in that house. The 
think this is the part where Loomis finds the car. Which is a little bit of a pothole, because if the car's been sitting there the whole time, how the fuck has he not seen it? He was in it yesterday. He knows exactly what it looks like. It says, it's ugly, it's brown, it says for official use on the side. The music hits, Oh, The timing of that music. Carpenter knows exactly when to start his music. Now shit just got real. Now he knows, for a fact, the paternity test came back. He's the father. It's time to shit or get off the pot. Make a living. He's gonna have to start doing YouTube videos or podcasts or something. No, I'm playing. At least about the last part. Shit did just get real though. It's confirmed. He knows for a fact Michael's there. It's honestly a pretty slow developing movie. It doesn't really have any fast sequences in it except for the very end chase scene, which still is kind of drawn out, but it plays well. It doesn't feel long. I believe that the actors had to wear their own clothes for this. So you wonder if Nick Castle just had an old torn up jumpsuit and that's what they decided he was going to wear. Or if they actually found one for him. It's a shame that they didn't know what they had when they made this. That they didn't preserve the mask better and those kind of things. Of course, if they'd known what they had, there would have been more cooks in the kitchen. And it all would have gotten fucked up. It didn't get fucked up because it was a singular vision. And it was executed in some ways out of necessity rather than a uh, choice. And sometimes that's the best way. Sometimes when your back's against the wall and you have to make quick decisions, it turns out better than when you have all the time in the world to think about it. Because you've just got to go. You can't overthink it. You just got to make decisions. And it plays out how it plays out. Perfection is the enemy of profitability. This creepy long walk across. Michael doesn't fuck with the jack-o'-lanterns. He likes them. He leaves them. <laughs> so to this point, it just seems to be a lot of Michael recreating the murder with his sister. To the best of his ability. He had Annie, you know, in her underwear and a men's dress shirt. He strangled her in the car and then stabbed her. He had PJ Souls naked in the bed. He strangled her. He got rid of the boyfriend, but that was more probably by necessity. He's an obstacle. Plus, he probably really wanted to kill his sister's boyfriend and really wishes he had. He had a lot of time to think about that. It's probably his main regret in life is that he didn't kill the, the original boyfriend when he was six. He's just too slow getting in the house and grabbing the knife. He could have pounced on him in the bottom of the staircase, but he's like half his size. You probably don't win that battle. So Michael at this point must be, he's stalking her to some effect. He expects her to come over there because he's going to put a rake on the outside of that door. It was open, like that's the way he wanted her to go in. But he's going to come around and put a rake on the outside and then get back in the house. I'll kill you if this is a joke. It's kind of a serious thing to say to somebody. You'll kill them if this is a joke. This would be a pretty elaborate joke for those idiots to pull. If we're being honest. Well, funny. Now cut it out. Sorry. She's gonna make them sorry. 
she's kind of used to this though as you've seen throughout the movie they kind of treat her like shit and abuse her so she's kind of expecting this to be a prank on her like everybody's just she's the butt of every joke in that group of friends that's okay she'll show them when she's older and has her shit together not if these three characters had been left to run the course of life and not been murdered or had Michael Myers in the story at all, Lori would have turned out the most successful of the bunch, believe you me. But two of them get murdered and Lori ends up seriously psychiatrically damaged by this. So Michael had a dramatic effect on the outcome of these three women's stories. <laughs> The tension that this music builds as you're coming, like... I, I can't convey with words how perfect it is. Michael's proud of what he does now. The, the, the first sister he just killed and moved on. The mechanic he killed and moved on. He actually kind of hid the body. But uh, now he's going to start flaunting. He's going to start flossing. He's looking to post some pictures on Instagram and get those likes. He's going to get a social media following. And maybe some groupies. Who knows? He's never spoken a word or shown his face and he has groupies in real life. He's a fictional character. So he laid out Annie with the Judith headstone. <laughs> He hung this dude upside down and rigged him to pop out. Which is really smart. Michael's an engineer, apparently. That was more stashed away than, than put out on display like the others. But he wants to terrify her. He cares about that. And then this shot here, they put a dimmer pointing directly down on the mask and just slowly turned it on. And it was meant to be like when your eyes adjust to the dark and you would go from not being able to see him to seeing him. That slice there, it doesn't seem like he wanted to get her, but that fucking fall, my God. <laughs> That's the only time he's got a little bit of a hop in his step. He's like, oh man, I gotta get to the front of the line before this family of six comes in. They're gonna order up all the french fries and I'm gonna have to wait. She's having a hell of a time with these doors. But now you see there's a rake on the outside of this. So he must have watched her go in there. And now he pursues, but he seems to let her go at the very end. He has trouble with her for some reason. Maybe he gets to the moment of truth and he's like, she doesn't quite deserve it, god damn it, but he's driven to it anyway. It's like a junkie who doesn't want the needle but can't help it. He's fainting on it. He's fainting on that lorry. She's walking and screaming. Stumbling and screaming. Does he come around the corner in pursuit? I can't remember. So these people, I totally understand it. <laughs> you want them to help her as an audience member, but if that was you and somebody knocked on your door like that, you'd be like, fuck, no. If Michael was chasing her, he moves so slow. Tommy, the boogeyman's real. Wake your ass up. Damn, she threw a flower pot at the house. That light turned on fast. The way Nick Castle moves is so fucking smooth. 
Like, eh, I, he probably just moved the way he moves naturally, but he created the the blueprint for how a scary motherfucker in a mask moves. Like, it was perfect casting. And it's not like they got to pick and choose. They didn't have the budget or the time. It just fell into place. I wonder how many movies similar to this got made that just got thrown by the wayside. Uh-oh. There's a window open. Somehow, some way, he's in there. You gotta have everything battened down. So he's behind the couch right now, and she didn't even think to, like, look around. She's just gonna crouch down and hide. Which doesn't seem to be a good move. Again, there. He couldn't get her. He doesn't... It's just like he doesn't quite want it. It's He's resisting. He's been going to NA meetings. If they had cell phones, he'd be on the phone with his sponsor right now. But he can't get a hold of him. He, there's no text messaging. Sidekicks haven't been invented yet. That's a big-ass knife. Look at his legs all crooked and fucked up. So the way they shot that was they had her swing behind his head. And because of the angle and how quick it is, you can't tell. And then they took a uh, knitting needle and stuck it into the side of the mask and then shot that part. It's kind of bent off and hanging there. You can tell that it's not in his neck. It's hanging from the rubber or the mask. Dr. Loomis is just wandering the streets like a creeper. It's kind of crazy. Him and Michael are doing similar things. They're creeping around houses and stalking people. It's just he's the good guy and Michael's the bad guy. <laughs> but they're, they're behaving very similar as far as just wandering around town looking at houses. They never really give you a scope of how big this place is or a footprint, which I guess helps with the small town feel because it's not actually a small town. It's shot in Pasadena, California, and they wouldn't really be able to give you an overview without you seeing LA or wherever, or the ocean. So, um, but it would be helpful to know just how big or small this town is. Just like in the second one, it'd be helpful to know the layout of the hospital, to know if Lori's room is right near the baby center or if it's close to the front door or if it's in the back or if that kind of shit it would make it easier to, to gauge what's going on that was a bit of a delayed reaction I would have seen him coming up the stairs five seconds before that see he could be he's penguin walking to her right now In the new remake, they they redo this bedroom, and they have a final showdown in it. God, the mask is so perfect. Just, it's kind of unbelievable that it was so hard for them to just make that exact same mask again. Considering you took a William Shatner mask and you modified it some and painted it, that shouldn't be that difficult to recreate. But the, it's been impossible. I mean, the new one, obviously, they didn't go that way because they wanted to make it aged and it couldn't look as pristine as this. But, like, four and five... It's, it's almost unbelievable that they weren't able to come up with something better. Even H2O. Of course, in the second one, it is this mask, but it's a few years older. It's stained, and the guy wearing it has a chubbier face, so it's stretched out. But it still works. This is probably the most iconic scene or footage from the entire movie. Often used in posters, t-shirts, gifts, all that. This... I never really liked this part with the coat hanger because it would not be easy to stab somebody with a coat hanger at all. They're flimsy as fuck. Or you'd have to grab the end really close and and have your hand two inches from the person to get any leverage and get that thing in there. Did you get him in the eye? Oh, is that where the damage happens to the eye? 
Okay, she gave him a good stab there. Now just stand up and stab him a bunch more times. I know you haven't seen a bunch of scary movies and you're not educated in how this works. I don't think that that was Nick Castle in the mask there for that scene. Uh, I want to say that it was a stunt coordinator and an effects coordinator. He actually built the closet doors so he knew the best spot to hit him in to break them and all that kind of stuff. So it just seemed natural for him to actually carry it out. And since you have a mask, you can have almost anybody in it. And as long as the proportions and the angle's right, it's going to work. That's also, I know they weren't thinking of it from this perspective, but when you have somebody in a mask, the star of the movie is a person in a mask. You never have to pay them because you can just change the person. And there's always going to be somebody who wants to play Michael Myers. They're not going to necessarily do a good job, but you're not creating a superstar. You can have Michael Myers in movies for eternity and never use the same guy again. It's kind of interesting. Whereas, you know, you make... Uh, Freddy Krueger. You gotta have Robert England. They tried to do that new one, and it just didn't turn out right. <clears throat> that sit-up move. Like, how, like, he does that better than anybody. How, <laughs> how did that work out that way? When other people try to do it, they look frumpy, they look out of shape, and he just boing! I'm not sure how old he was when, uh, this was filmed because he's supposed to be playing a 21 year old when you're 21 you can just pop the fuck up from shit <laughs> you fall asleep on the floor with a piece of pepperoni pizza under your head he doesn't quite want to get like he's just it's almost there so this is the only part in this film where you see his face she's about to pull his mask off and his eye is kind of goofy and I, I've always wondered why that is, and I just realized it might be because she stabbed him with the coat hanger? Or is he just supposed to be kind of deformed and fucked up looking? I don't exactly get it. Yeah, that's not fresh. That's healed over. Why is his eye fucked up? Now there's the one shot. Michael tucks the mask in. <laughs> Michael almost doesn't know what to do. He's, he's met Loomis, and he just freezes there and takes a hard fall off the balcony. And then that's how Carpenter didn't intend for this to be, or to turn into sequels. But it's kind of interesting because if he didn't want any sequels, he could have just left it with Michael laying there. I know it makes it scarier to have him get up and hear the breathing and everything. You can see the smoke from the gun. That's crazy. I know it's scarier to have him get up and you hear the breathing and he could be anywhere and he survived it. But that really lends itself to a sequel because the natural thing people are going to argue is, did he survive? Where did he go? What happened? All that kind of shit. So it just seems natural to make the movie explaining that. And then there you are. Like, this feels right now like the end of an episode of Game of Thrones where you're going, oh, fuck. The wall just got destroyed by a dragon. What's going to happen? And then the credits roll and you can't wait to watch the next one. That's what they did here, unintentionally. And Loomis is playing this like he knew. That's that's the way that Carpenter said that Donald Pleasance asked if he should play it like he surprised or like he knew all along it would turn out this way. And he chose to play it like he, he knew all along. Like he hoped that it, Michael would still be there, but he really knew he wouldn't be. And now it shows all the different places that we had scenes with Michael and the breathing. There's his house. 709, I think it says. Halloween. What can you say? It's the classic slasher film. It's the best in the entire Halloween series, as is usually the case. The, the first sequels are usually not better. Uh, it started a weird cult following a bunch of spin-offs, a bunch of alternate storylines, remakes, reboots. It's kind of crazy. Um, yeah, I, I love watching this movie. I could watch it a hundred times. 
I probably have seen it a hundred times. And uh, I'm just... I'm amazed by what they were able to, to kind of accidentally create. Um, to make something so iconic with almost no thought. And not no thought. Let's. I want to give them credit, but... This wasn't some... Uh, you know, a story that somebody spent a lifetime thinking about and then finally came out with or had a lot of time to tinker with and get the details right and truly, like, he just had to go and he came up with something fucking amazing. So, uh, I will be continuing doing these commentaries on the whole series. I, uh, you can catch me, some of you are listening to this on a podcast, on SoundCloud, iTunes, whatever, some of you on YouTube. Uh, you can find it Avarice Podcast. You can find me at Avarice Trading on YouTube, Avarice Trading on Instagram. Like and subscribe, all of that good shit. I'm glad that you joined me for this little sesh. And uh, until the next time, be easy.